This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast for visiting television, sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Auto Man, Episode 1. You must be Walter Nevicott. How did you know that? It's on the programming you fed into my system. I must say, Walter, you're very good. Very good indeed. I look wonderful. If you do say so yourself. You programmed me to be honest. But tell me. Why did you call me Auto Man? It means that you're the world's first truly automatic man. You can do anything because you're not real. Oh, but I am. I'm as real as you are. Just different. And thanks to you. Perfect. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast that invites you to come enter our dimension. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? On a scale of 1 to 10, think of me as an 11. This this auto man is very full of himself. He is, yeah. He's very no. He's just he's just very confident. <laughs> well, before we get into what we're watching this week, because we're starting a new show, we're going to be joined by a guest to get started. It's uh, of course, returning guest Kevin. Welcome back to the show, Kevin. Thank you very much, guys. So it's been a while. I think we last time you were here, we wrapped up the Planet Earth trilogy. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we had we had some full on John Saxon excitement last time. All right, it was John Saxon. I'm trying to remember where, who was who. When did John Saxon come to the? He was the last two. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> did we ever talk about was that a toupee he was wearing? And I'm going to say through his entire career. Yeah. Listen, we could actually we could do a whole separate podcast just about John Saxon's hair because I've actually studied it in some detail, <laughs> and I and I am fairly certain. Although you can find movies where the hair looks pretty good, you can find movies where it doesn't. I'm pretty sure it's a toupee. I would, yeah, I'm, I think I'm so sort too. Of up in the eighty to ninety percent. Yeah, yeah, it has so. that. It has that weird telling no part thing going on. Yeah, and the part weirdly way over to one side. Like you mm-hmm. can tell he's a fully bald man, and the solution is a side part that starts an inch above his ear that crosses <laughs> yeah. the head. It's that's not really the way hair works. And also, I always think it's mysterious if someone has what is clearly a receding hairline, but then it never moves throughout their entire adult life. You go, well, he should have been getting balder as he got older, which did mm. not seem to happen. You can find pictures of him as an older guy at conventions and stuff with no hair. So. Mm. Um, I think that, but you know, it was a good toupe. I think he had a good piece. It wasn't like William Shatner where he had the good toupee, which segued into the awful toupees. Like Mm -hmm. I think Saxon kept it at the same level his whole career. I hope just because I know it throws Luke off that we just talk about toupees for an hour and never get to (laughs) auto man. I was just going to say, I I think Jason Alexander does toupees, right? I think he uses them (laughs) just as he sees fit. And I think that's the way to go. Just be bald sometimes, have a toupee other times. Why not? Totally. I always think that Sean Connery is that, right? It's like, he's the guy who's Mm -hmm. like, he's not trying to convince you he has hair. He's just wearing different fun hair hats for different movies, right? Like, and he knows it looks ridiculous in, in Hunt for Red October, but that's okay. It works for the character. He, he'll do publicity for that movie without his wig on, and that's totally cool. I think that's the way to go. Yeah, As absolutely. opposed to the, you know, fake fiction of, no, this is my hair my entire adult life, you know, wearing a wearing a, a, a wig every time you go out in public. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we don't have enough, like, great bald actors anymore. So, like, what you could you could corner that market. But totally. Well, somebody pointed out recently that the Fast and the Furious franchise is full of bald men. It was very unusually <laughs> so that you've got Vin Diesel and The Rock and Jason Statham and all these guys who they might tell themselves they're not really bald, that they just shave their heads. But we know we know it's we know it started from them looking in the mirror one day and going, oh, my God, it's going. I'm just going to shave it all off. So that's that's the bald franchise. That's but where they live. That, eh? That's where, that's who's a monopolized bald actor. <laughs> yeah, they all went to that one franchise. But I'll tell you who's got a great head of hair. Auto Man. Yes, yes, Auto Man has gorgeous locks. Well, All he's right. perfect. Yeah, he well, is perfect. He's week, an 11 out of 10. <laughs> well, this week we're starting a new series. It's Auto Man, as we've talked about already in this thing. And it's it's uh, from 1983. And I had no idea the show existed before we started watching it. This is like new territory for me. But did either of you, had either of you heard of Auto Man before? I hadn't. I mean, I'm I'm familiar with the work of Glenn Larson, you know, as our we we did Galactica nineteen ninety together, which was you mean one. Glenn Larceny, <laughs> Glenn Larceny, Glenn A Larceny, yes. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I, I probably had seen this on lists of shows, but whereas like Manimal, which is another terrible sci-fi show he did around this time, I, I remember seeing and I remember laughing at it at the time. Because, you know, Manimal is a show where a guy can turn into any animal as long as it's a hawk or a panther, because that's what we have footage <laughs> of. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, no, I, the short answer is no. I didn't know this show existed, and it was an amazing... Just from the watching the first 30 seconds, I was like amazed at the adventure we were going to go on together guys like just from those opening titles it was like oh my god what is this show <laughs> and uh i should say that you know we're mentioning it's a glenn a larson show and i think maybe people don't realize how powerful this guy must have been because he just had show after show after show and obviously not all hits but i was looking into it a little bit and when this show aired automan he had four other shows on the air at the time and those were knight rider the Fall Guy, Masquerade, and Magnum P.I. And the only one of those I don't remember is Masquerade. Kevin, do you remember what Masquerade is? No, I don't. I, I don't, don't think anyone does. But anyways, it's a, he had five TV shows on there. I think Chuck Lorre had, at his peak, maybe had four. Yeah, that's like Greg Berlanti level. Like, yeah. you know, you're a super showrunner at that point, you know. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I'm surprised I haven't done more Glenn Larson then, considering how many shows he had. <laughs> maybe they're yeah, too successful I- for us. Well, and you know, and so, and he didn't do that much genre stuff. I mean, he did some for sure, but he also did a lot of Quincy and those kind of shows, so mm. more detectivey kind of things that wouldn't necessarily fall within the the remit of uh, of this podcast. But but yeah, he was a, a an inescapable force in television. I think in the in the seventies and eighties, and not and not necessarily for the better. Well, since we're talking about the seventies and eighties, here is what was happening in the world during Auto Man, uh, according to my minimal Wikipedia research. Uh, <laughs> so it ran from December fifteenth, nineteen eighty three, to August twenty fifth, nineteen eighty four, and I've got a got a list of things here. Let's see what wows you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> On uh, January twenty second, nineteen eighty four, the iconic. Apple ad of 1984 throwing the uh, throwing the hammer through the screen that mm. aired for the first time. Impressive. Mm. January 25th, President Ronald Reagan announces his plans for an international space station. Oh yes, is that the Star Wars? No, no, this was for the this was for the International Space Station. Oh, not his laser. Not his laser. Although, do you know what the original name for the International Space Station was going to be? No, what What's was that? it? It's very American. Uh, fr- freedom, freedom time, six thousand. Space Station Freedom. Yeah, I was pretty close. <laughs> Jordan, good job. Good job. Oh, Absolutely. by the way, oh, on that, on Luke, on that w- that show we watched um, last season, didn't wasn't there a Ronald Reagan Space Station? Yeah, Star Cops. They go to the Ronald Reagan Space Station. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this probably is a direct reference to it, I'm sure. Right. right. Um, oh, here's one just for, just for me. Uh, May 19th, the Edmonton Oilers win the Stanley Cup and begin their 80s dynasty. Mm. <laughs> Woo! Um, uh, some gamer news for Jordan. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I'm a big gamer. Yeah, June sixth, Tetris is released. Oh, Tetris. Oh, yeah, that's the wow. one with the blocks. Yeah, <laughs> the origin of Tetris. <laughs> and July twenty fifth, the first woman walks in space. Oh, hmm. who was that? Uh, a Russian lady. Did I write hmm. down her name? Let's find out. <laughs> Well, I've lost my place in my notes, so we're never going to know. <laughs> it is a funny thing. I think it's actually a Norm MacDonald bit, but it is like, we know the two people, you know, you know, Buzz Aldrin and, you know, Neil Armstrong, but then everyone else who essentially went to space, we're just like, well, I don't know who they are, but I'm like, yeah. they were all, they also did important things. I wrote yeah, it down, to... actually. Svetlana Savitskia. So we probably could have guessed that. We probably could have <laughs> got there. <laughs> just sound it out. You'll, you'll get yeah. there. And Jordan, finally, before we move on, mm-hmm. because you love to be asked this question, uh, how about how about a quick Oscar quiz? Oh yeah, okay. Who is who is the host of the Oscars in 1984? In 1984, uh, I'm gonna guess it was Johnny Carson. You're you're 100 percent correct. Wow, wow, yeah. impressive. And then I meant yeah. to write down what won Best Picture, but I accidentally just wrote down the producer who won for Best Picture, so I don't know what the Best Picture <laughs> what, was. What year was it? 1984. 84 would, would it no i was gonna say amadeus i think that was 82 kevin yeah. do you remember how's your how's your oscar knowledge not that good maybe gandhi maybe mm, maybe gandhi i only wrote down the producer's name so all we know is it was james l brooks that won <laughs> all i know is oh no terms of endearment oh terms, terms of endearment that must yeah, be yeah. it <laughs> sorry what were you saying jordan i was just gonna say there was all no you... way for us to look it up 
<laughs> <laughs> no way. All right. Let's get into it, guys. Here's the IMDb summary for episode one, Auto Man. A computer nerd creates a, quote, man called, quote, <laughs> Auto Man, bracket, <laughs> Automatic Man, end bracket. <laughs> and uses him, bracket, and his holographic car and a talking cursor, end bracket, to solve crimes. And that was courtesy of Frank Fob 2. Thanks, Frank Fob 2. But I do like, though, that they do mention in this show... It's Auto Man, short for Automatic Man. I'm like, you don't need to tell anybody that. Auto Man's fine. You don't need to go into it. You're like, hey, Batman. By the way, it's Batman because he looks like a bat. Uh, it's just like, we get it. Yeah, we figured it out. Oh, I, I want to correct Frank Fob and just say that Cursor does not talk. Although if he did talk, uh, it it would be a lot of terrible sexual innuendo, um, a, a lot of very abusive, inappropriate workplace. I, I uh, love it. I love that what we learn about Cursor, the apparently just glowing ball of light that has some sort of personality and the personality is horny yeah <laughs> yes he he is here to sexually assault women <laughs> and it happens right off the right off the bat in the opening credits he yes, goes and like she... i think he pinches a woman's breast i think yeah and she screams like in like in that you know like all this is the music playing and then you hear this ah she's assaulted by cursor I mean, we'll get into it, but this yeah. cursor character who, yeah, only appears on screen if there's a woman to harass or he'll, like, draw vehicles that mm-hmm. are, he has no pur- – there's no purpose to cursor. Cursor has no purpose but is is a character on the show. Yeah. Yeah, and did you notice how he's Bizarre. credited? Credited as cre- He's credited as cursor on the opening credits. <laughs> they thought that the cursor was going to be a real breakout character. Yeah, totally. he was going to be their gizmo. How are you yeah. going to make a toy out of Cursor? This is the thing I don't understand. You're really pushing it, but like, how are you ever going to market a glowing ball that floats around? <laughs> yeah. At any rate, the, the pilot starts off with something we haven't seen in a while, and I actually don't think we've seen this variation of it, but the pilot starts off with a quick like minute and a half that essentially explains the concept of the series. Like, it tells you, it's like, hey, I made this guy named Auto Man, and he appears, and he's a crime fighter, and he's perfect. All right, bye, let's watch the pilot. <laughs> It was very odd. It felt to me like maybe this was a solution to a problem that they were having. Like maybe they had shot something that didn't work and they said, we'll distill that down to the explanation because it seemed there was a whole implied story there that we didn't see. Like you see there's a car chase and the whole thing of, you know, Walter's boss didn't like him solving crime in the streets. It's like, well, we didn't really understand what that was about. And then you see Auto Man creating a helicopter at one point, which in, in that ex, exp, explanatory beginning, I don't know where, when did that happen? Like, it seems like the adventure we're about to watch is the first adventure of Walter and Auto Man. But yeah. that opening implies there have been previous adventures. Plus that opening expl, explanation comes after two minutes of opening credits, which kind of give you the idea anyway. There's a there's a Tron-looking dude who creates Tron-looking vehicles, and he's got a nerdy cop partner, and they solve crimes. Like, that's already laid out in that opening. Then a, then a voiceover starts going, his name is Walter, and walks you through a much more detailed version of it. It's a very odd thing. It, it was very strange to me, too. Because I, I was like, are we... Oh, so is this not going to be an origin story? We're just going to get right into it? But then it is it also an origin story after yeah, they've given exactly. you the origin story? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're right, Kevin. It's, it seems like a studio note of no one's going to be able to follow this, throw this in, but it just couldn't be more disjointed the way it was. I, I didn't even understand what was happening. I was like, wow, they're really getting into this fast. It's like, oh, no, they're not. They're just... Yeah. One more time. <laughs> just to remind you, because you won't be able to follow. Like, hold on. <laughs> this guy's got a super suit. I One more time. I don't understand. You couldn't, Plus, they didn't want the audience to wait 20 minutes and turn it off. They're like, we better explain to them up front. There's yeah. going to be an auto man in this. Yeah, well, I think you're absolutely right. That if you, don't, if you didn't have that opening, then you don't get to see auto man for a long time into the story. Because this follows that kind of 70s and 80s thing of like, there's a big science fiction idea that we can't really afford to do really well. So it's only going to happen twice per hour at most, right? So you're going to have to wait. That was the same with The Incredible Hulk or any of those shows where it's like, as a kid, you'd be like, well, I just wanted to be the Hulk all the time. It's like, no, we can't afford that. He can <laughs> he can be the Hulk at about 20 minutes into the show yeah. for about 90 seconds. And then he yeah. can be the Hulk in the climax. And that's yeah, the, the rest of it is just Bill Bixby walking around. Yeah, totally. He's getting a job at a diner. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lady who's having a problem with her husband. Like, that's, that's, uh, that's the incredible Hulk. But are you trying to say that uh, Desi Arnaz Jr. is not enough of a draw for the first 20 minutes? <laughs> oh, my God. Or this whole, uh, what we're about to get into, this whole plot about 
kidnapped scientists and whatever. Yeah. As if that's not enough to drag you in and keep yeah. you, you know, wondering what's going to happen next. But I'm going to mention something that happens later. There is a really huge plot hole with this whole uh, kidnapping scientist. But anyways, <laughs> we'll get to it. Well, let's talk about that now because this is how it kicks off. As we sort of get the plot that the episode's going to be about is uh, scientists are being kidnapped from their families by being offered a flight, a chance to fly in a private jet when they get to the airport. So they have a commercial plane ticket booked. But then these goons show up and they're like, how would you like to fly on a private jet? And every time they're like, absolutely. And as soon as they get on, they're kidnapped. <laughs> yeah, which which I don't think ever has happened to anyone at an airport, at least no one I know. But also, if I was in that situation and I had my flight booked and some two weird guys come over and go, hey, we're a special security team that is working with the company that you work with. We've decided we're putting on a private plane. I'd say, I think I need to call somebody. I wouldn't just <laughs> jump on a plane. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I liked is the first guy, too, he, like, is with his family, and they just approach him, and they're like, come with us. And, like, the police can't put together how this is happening. I'm like, well, did you interview the family? They, I think they have a clue. <laughs> yeah, I think right away, you, you, the thing you understand about the show, as soon as you get into the, the mystery, is this is a kid's show. Like, all of the logic mm. is at a kid's show level, because none of it. Yeah, because like, I started to ask the questions about, well, I don't understand what are the police doing and how is this happening? And how would this happen at an airport? And how could nobody track where there was a plane? Like planes aren't that mysterious. They have to f file flight plans. And uh, but then you go, oh, this is made for 10 year olds. And, oh, yes, OK, so yes. then uh, I started to give it a lot of slack from that point forward, which does not excuse all the horrible things we're going to talk about. But I, I did start to go, OK, narratively this is goofy and that's okay because it's a kid's show. Like when the cops started to take the cop, who I'm going to keep calling Gary seven. Cause he was Gary seven on the original star Trek. Um, he, when he's, when he's telling Walter, we've got to figure out this kidnapping case. And he's taking like parking receipts out of his pocket that have like scribbles <laughs> on them. Like, and just dropping it on a table saying, feed this into your computer. I was like, okay, this is like Batman 1966 level logic of how computers work. But what I love is it has, and I've mentioned this in previous podcast, it has your classic, late 1970s early 1980s computer room it's as if there was one set that was used in every movie and every tv show from about 1965 to about nine late 1960s to early 1980s where it's just a big room with big computers with knobs and flashing lights and but there's there's only one real console that you sit at the rest is just for decoration totally yes this is this is at the lapd which is where i guess the show set we're in la we're, we're working mostly out of the LAPD spa uh, station. And as we've said, the cops can't figure it out. With the sole exception, I believe, did you call him Gary Seven? This is Gary the Seven, cop. Yeah. This is the cop, Lieutenant Jack Curtis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great name. And yeah. he, he seems to be the only one who's on to what's going on here. And he's working with some sort of Interpol agent whose only name we get, they just call her Tanya. She has no last name. <laughs> Well, and she's really Carmen San Diego, isn't she? When she yeah, first she shows is. up, I'm, she's like hundred percent Carmen San Diego. But where, are they implying that they have an? I know that they have a working relationship. Are they also implying that they have some sort of romantic, like entanglement as well? Or am I just reading into that? I don't know. I don't. I didn't get that. But it's anything goes on this show. Yeah, they seemed awfully familiar when they finally connect later in the story when over in Switzerland. But but it's it's left very vague. It's I mean, everything about her is very big. <laughs> yeah, hmm. that's right. You're connecting some dots there. Yeah. For your fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like, though, that, that, that this, this mystery of these people getting uh, kidnapped is enough for not only the local government, the Los Angeles Police Department, to look into, but also Interpol. But then after, you know, the scenes that are going to happen, everyone kind of just puts up their hands and goes, oh, well, I don't know what we yeah. can do. I'm like, there's all these agencies working on it. No? No one? Auto Man? The the only people with clues appear, appear to be Tanya and this Lieutenant Curtis character. And, like, because they, at right at the beginning, they're like, we figured it out. It has something to do with private planes. And uh, they just walk onto the tarmac, and Curtis is immediately shot and kidnapped. And then Tanya just runs away. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess that went well. Um, but this is because, I guess, Curtis is uh, not so much the lead of the, uh, lead of the, uh, the, the pilot, if you will. They need to go back to the LAPD because this show centers around, is he a police officer or is he their IT tech? I'm not sure. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a man named Walter Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I was completely confused as well, Luke. They, they definitely introduce him as a police officer at the beginning. In the voiceover at the beginning, when they say, Walter's a police officer, and, and they show him being involved in a car chase, which, as you go through the fu uh, future episodes, I'm curious to see whether they grabbed footage from a future episode of a car chase to establish that. But anyway, 
as soon as you get into his daily life, he does not appear to be a police officer. All the cops look down on him. Um, Jack is the only one who treats him with any respect, which he says, like, you're the only one that listens to me, you know. Um, he totally seems to be an IT guy, but they do call him a police officer, so... Shrug. And his job is so weird because they basically imply like Captain Boyd clearly does not like that he has this computer room. He's he's an old fashioned cop. He doesn't like computers, but they say very clearly just like we have this computer room because it's a federal government project and we're getting a lot of money for it. So we just have to keep it in that corner with old old Wally as they like to call him. Uh, but they just don't want anything to do. They just want the money from the government grant that put the computer room in their office. <laughs> Yes, he even suggests that he's kind of cooking the books because he's like, those four new detectives we hired, they're all paid for by the computer thing. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, wait, are you taking money that was supposed to go into more hard drives or whatever, the big reel-to-reel tape machines and, and using it to finance more cops? Like, I don't know if the federal government will be happy with you, Captain. It's very weird. And as you mentioned, like, Detective Curtis has been using Wally to investigate. Like, he gives him all those scraps of paper and says, can you have the computer talk to other computers and see if any of the scraps I've written down mean anything? <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. again, the great police work he's like i've got 17 facts that i he even says so you're talking about cross-referencing <laughs> <laughs> didn't do that when i started out it's like yes they did yes they did jack <laughs> cross-referencing is a thing that police have always done i thought that was very funny as well he's just refused to believe cross-referencing existed i'm like you're a terrible <laughs> police officer aren't you? <laughs> cross-referencing we usually just pull them into the alley and beat them until they admitted <laughs> stuff <laughs> exactly but what nobody knows is that old Wally Nebuchadnezzar has been using these uh, government computers for his own secret private project, experiments with holograms. So we're, we're going to get into this real quick that he has created a program which will, we will find out, is going to be Auto Man, which is, I guess, just a hologram, but a hologram that is tactile and has density. Um, we'll come to but... learn that he he's able to control electrical energy to give it like mass and weight. It just takes power for him to do it, I guess. But he can also be. Let's, you want to talk about Auto Man? Yeah, but can I mention one thing real quick? Uh, maybe my favorite thing on the show was. Did you notice what his password to get into the Auto Man program is? No, it's Auto Man. <laughs> no, no, Auto Man's the program, and then you have to type co- Crime Fighter as the credentials to get. Oh, it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, I either way, he could have come up with like put an exclamation mark or something in there, <laughs> an asterisk something. Yeah. Well, no, everyone would type in his full name, Jordan, Automatic Man. <laughs> That's right. You're right. <laughs> Is it? No, it's also it's Auto Man one word, right? It's not like Spider Man with the hyphen. That's correct. It's a good one question. Word. I thought it was two words. <laughs> No, I think it's just auto. If you say automatic man, it's two. But once you go auto man, you just shorten it to one word. <laughs> um, let's talk about this auto man. So he's created a hologram in this computer that he can materialize using the electricity grid. It, like, cause he's powered by electricity, apparently, for whatever reason. How he's holographic is never made clear. But he can materialize when typing in this password. And Wally made him by combining the likeness of six celebrities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And yes. I've written them down. I don't know if you guys wrote them down. I didn't oh, yeah. know who two of them were. Oh, I'll I didn't know two you. either. Okay, so here's let's let's go off. I know the the first one's Paul Newman. Yes. Yep. Luke, who's your who's the second one? Christopher Reeve. Yeah. Then it was Burt Reynolds. Uh huh. Which, by the way, that's making a problem with Auto Man right away. But anyway, <laughs> no, the third person I didn't know. I didn't know who it was, but it looked vaguely like a young Merv Griffin. I know that's not who it was, but I do no, like the it, thought that it was Merv Griffin. Who was it? That that is Lee Majors. That is oh, the was Lee Majors, Man and the Fall guy. Yep. Ah, oh. and then there was Tom Selleck. Yeah. Yep. And then I didn't know who the last guy was. The last one was Richard Burton, which means that ah. Auto Man has a serious drinking problem. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. Like, of, of the, like, you know, I, I could just picture uh, uh, Glenn Larson sitting at his desk trying to think of who the sixth person should be and like how he yeah. came to Ri- Richard Burton of all of the sort of, okay, listen, let's unpack this a little bit more because so pretty police lady whose name I did not bother to notice the show did not give her any respect so neither will I she's discussing with him what this project is what are you doing secretly within the police lab or in the, in the computer lab and he says um, that he's created this uh, hologram which he then says is an electronic simulation in three dimensions okay I'm with you so far then he says here I'll show you and he takes out his little binder with pictures of handsome men <laughs> and then he, he says you take pictures of someone and then she interrupts to say, that's four people. 
And he says, yes, but then I added more. And he turns a page to show that there's two more people. <laughs> I don't know why she's impressed at four. And then he says, I added two more. And then they go, okay, oh, that's logical. Okay, so six, obviously, that's where you ended. And then he says, um, now they're all in there together. They're becoming one. So that's how you that's how you explain what a hologram is. You take out pictures of celebrities from your briefcase and you say, see, it's these four plus two becoming one. Understand science? That's what and, it is. And I got to say, because the actor who plays Automan, doing a great job. I'm not going to fault him. I think he's actually doing a great job. Yeah. But like, does he even remotely look like any of those six people? No, no. I tell you, I, I figured out who he sounds like. He's, it took me a while. I kept thinking, he's using this weird clipped diction thing. And I realized, oh, he's Jay Peterman from Seinfeld. That's exactly <laughs> who he sounds like. He's sort of like alone in the Borneo forest. Like he's ex- exactly like that. I like, though, that they, that was Richard Burton. So I have a better four people. It's Richard Burton, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole, and Oliver Reed. That's who the four <laughs> people should be. And all Auto Man does is just drink and fight. And that's it. That's all he does. Well, Auto Man has been designed to be the perfect detective and the perfect, like, hologram. And what do you need to feed into a computer to make the perfect detective? There's only two two things you need. <laughs> Exactly, like, hmm, perfect detective, perfect detective, hmm. First of all, you'd start with fictional characters. You wouldn't start with actual detectives. <laughs> 100%. That's real skill you just sense. want to feed some novels into them. <laughs> oh, so we got, crazy. We got Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, obviously. Obvs. Who was the second? James Bond. James Bond. Oh, it's James Bond. That's right, because he does a, he does a spot-on James Bond impersonation later. <laughs> exactly. That's crazy. There is a scene, which is not important, but, like, they bump into Wally's landlady, and then, you know, Auto Man charms her. But then they play the James Bond theme. And I was just like, was James Bond less litigious right now? <laughs> yeah, I know. I thought so, too. And also, I thought that with the pictures of those celebrities. I thought, mm-hmm. so did he call Paul Newman? Did Glenn Larson call Paul Newman and say, you're going to be one-sixth of Auto Man. It's never going to be mentioned in dialogue, but your picture will be there. Like, if not, that's pretty weird. Knowing what I know about Glenn Larson and his ability to steal everything, I'm assuming he just went for it and thought, oh, let him sue me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's one last thing I want to just mention about Automan, and maybe you guys can help describe this. But like the big thing about Automan, other than being like sort of a, a handsome, suave, debonair man, he is wearing this like glowing blue suit. That's almost I love I, it. It's so hard to explain because it is like it's glowing. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, I don't know the whole backstory of this. I did a little reading online, but not much. But clearly, this show starts with. Glenn Larson going to see Tron. Right? Yeah. And then him saying, right, we should make a TV show where a guy looks like that. And because it's that same technology where it's almost like it's burning, the lines in his suit are like burning a hole in the film. Like there's no detail at all. It's just like these super bright straight lines where the edges of his suit are. But then the interesting thing that they did is, and I don't know how they did this, but his suit itself, like between the lines, it's like it's just disappeared entirely and been replaced by this like star field. But the star field never moves. So yeah. as he walks, the stars look like they're shifting around his body, but it's really because there's a static image behind him that he's walking in front of. It's a kind of a cool effect, frankly. I mean, it's really distracting, but I don't think I'd seen anything like it before. I kind of, I kind of was like, thumbs up, Glenn Larson. Like that's kind of a interesting. It, you know, it cool looks look. interesting. There's no doubt about it. It's because it's like such a bright neon blue that just n- not of this world, which is the point. But it's just like it's effective. But I did start to wonder, like, he doesn't have to look like that, right? Like, we can talk about this later in the episode, but when we're creating Mm -hmm. auto vehicles, we can decide whether they look blue and glowy. So uh, maybe it comes down to his overall arrogance that he knows he looks good. He says, (laughs) doesn't he he say I look magnificent or whatever at one point? So he likes looking blue and glowy, I guess. And and while we're talking about Auto Man, I wanted to mention a, a weird thing that I noticed in that in this sort of time period of TV shows, there seems to be this weird, like, fail safe that the writers want to always throw in with these type of characters and i was looking back at old shows like we did a show very similar north star where jack north has his powers but he can only use them for a short amount of time or he overloads overloads in gemini man uh sam casey can only be invisible for 30 seconds and in this show auto man he can only be auto man at night and i i guess i get why narratively they want to have these limitations because you don't want to have these people be super powerful and have no real conflict but it also seems like is this necessary isn't there another way of doing things other than having him only be able to be auto man at night doesn't that seem to be a limit for limit sake i wonder if a piece of it is does that blowing glue costume stand out in the day because 
like it works great when you're in dark environments because it looks like a cool mm. blink. But if you put Auto Man in the light of day, glowing blue, does that work? I, I'm wondering if it maybe the effect works better at night. And they're just like, let's just write this in. So they can, they wrote it in a great way because he doesn't have to be at night. But the problem is he draws his electricity from like the public power grid. And so he tells us in this episode, he's like, I can really only work at night because when people wake up, they start making their toast and they start putting on Good Morning America and all the power goes away. So I, I'm, I'm not, I can't work as effectively. So Wally, you and I got to work nights as detectives. And then in the morning, you got to go to your job and work. And I don't know when you sleep, but I go to bed in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think both of you guys are right. I think you know, Jordan, I, there's definitely that thing of limiting the powers, which almost all of these shows start to forget about as they go on. Like, I'll be really curious to see as this show goes on whether they keep reminding you that there's limitations on when he can be Auto Man, or whether they're just going to start to go, oh screw it, he's got to summon Auto Man to solve to fight the bad guys, and we don't want to shoot exterior night because it's more expensive, and we'll just even if it doesn't look as good. Like I noticed in the coming next episode trailer at the end there was a there was a a moment where you saw auto man wearing like a suit jacket over his auto man suit so i thought oh i wonder if they're like it's going to be during the day the blue glow is not going to work we got to find other tricks around it because i it feels like in this episode there's moments where auto man is there or not there more on the basis of what the script requires than any kind of logic like yeah like the fact that he can fly in a plane across the atlantic ocean i'm like well, what power grid is he tied into absolutely now? I thought the same thing. I'm like, he just flew across the ocean. Where Where's he getting his power from? And then he lands and goes, oh, well, people are plugging in their toasters. I better... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Kevin, you do a great auto man. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I think you're right. It is it is just there for writing purposes. And like they've kept it so loose, you can tell just like, it's when the power is going down, which really we can say is any time we like. Yeah. Yeah, what, what, are you home viewer? Are you monitoring the power grid? Trust us. They, this, <laughs> he has an issue right now. He's going to disappear. But yeah, so there's this idea that he's created this thing, and you mentioned her, Roxanne. She's a woman who works at the police station, but uh, like right, Roxanne, you could ne- you don't know her last name, and like it is impossible to know what she does at the police station other than like walk in on Wally. And they need to give Wally or Walter a like little bit of time to build his character. So like, there's this thing where he's like, "I need, I'm gonna get Auto Man to help me solve what happened to Detective Curtis." But he's like, "Oh, he's still processing, so he's not going to appear." And the lady's like, "Well, why don't we go out and get a coffee in the meantime?" And it's just so they can like introduce Wally a little. And the introduction was so weird because it's this like woman he works with, and the first thing he says to her, he's just like, "I keep asking you out, and you keep saying no." And she's just like, "Yeah, I'm not interested." And he's like, "Oh." <laughs> And I'm like, oh, what's wrong with... Is Wally a bad person? <laughs> and then you see him in, in what I guess is his apartment. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you see him, that, that yes. she comes walking. I'm like, what was that space? That did not seem like... He has like a Ghostbusters basement. <laughs> he's in yeah. the basement of the building he's renting an apartment from that he's set up this massive computer system. It's It's crazy. And she's just walking into it. But they end up going out for drinks. So we kind of see, I guess, Wally in the world. Or they go for, like, a sandwich at a diner. And when her and Wally are sitting there, it's not a date. She's made that very clear to him. But these (laughs) three bikers are at the diner, too. And they're like, how could that nerd be with such a beautiful woman? Let's go hassle them. But what I did like, and I don't know. I I don't know how much you watch Rob Zombie movies. But one of those uh, bikers was Sid Hogg. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Totally. I, I, it, seeing Sid in this, it totally made me wah. And the other main guy is Mickey Jones, who That's played right. Tough Guy Bikers in all, like, right, I think he just died in the last couple of years. Right up to his the end of his life, he was still playing Tough Guy Bikers. But the great piece of trivia about him was he was also a drummer, and he played in Bob Dylan's band in the mid-60s when oh. Bob did that tour, but going mm. electric for the first time. So, yeah, it t- as soon as Sid and Mickey showed up, I was like, well, this is interesting. I mean, actually... This show is full of interesting guest stars, right? Like Patrick McNee, who we can talk mm-hmm. about in a little bit. It's like Avengers. I mean, I, I find him a bit of a hack, but you know, he's definitely a real guest star. Like that's not a nothing to get Patrick McNee to be in your pilot. Yeah, it seemed like the casting was surprised. Like, I mean, I don't know most of these actors as well as perhaps other people, but like everyone seemed to be very well cast. And I'm like, oh, what's going on in the show? Yeah, yeah, it's a real who's who's of like weird character actors that are like number six on a call sheet. Um, th- uh, for their entire career, it's like all the police officers. I'm like, I know this guy from yeah. somewhere. Didn't wasn't he in an episode of Mash or wasn't he yep. in Dynasty? It's like all these actors that you just recognize them, but none of them are that well known. Totally, yes. you're like that. Guy, definitely from Barney Miller. That guy must have yeah. been on Barney <laughs> yeah, Miller, exactly. or whatever. 
But yes, to help establish Wally's character in this diner, they have these bikers come up and start, like, hassling them for, like, because she's too beautiful to be with them. And what I like is, like, every time they try to introduce a new trait for Wally, it's always, like, a negative trait. Because, like, the bikers come up, they start hassling them, and Roxanne, who she's who he's with, is just like, all right, you guys, that's enough. And Wally's just like, I'm not going to take this anymore. And she's just like, Wally, just leave it alone. He's just like, no, shut up, Roxanne. Like, he tells her to <laughs> shut up. He's going to stand up to these bullies. And I'm just like, you just told the woman you're with to shut. Like, he, I'm just like, Wally, you're, you're su- this is such a bad introduction to your character. <laughs> it is a funny thing, though, because I think they really want to establish the um, uh, how opposite Auto Man and Wally are. So... Uh, you know, he's uh, Auto Man is essentially everything Wally wants to be. He's smart and he's good looking and he's powerful and he's confident. And Wally is none of these things. But what's interesting is it almost plays out like, you know, like a, a, a 60s comic book, you know, like Spider Man. He's mild mannered, but then he's Spider Man. Or it's Superman as Clark Kent, but then he's Superman. But what's weird about this is it's two separate people. It's not like he becomes Auto Man and gains that confidence and people don't really understand the greatness that's within him it's like no he 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 is just a whiny guy and the other guy's going to solve all the problems it's just it's a very weird uh decision that they made it seems Mm -hmm. like he should become auto man right yeah totally it feels like that's what this show really wants to be is is a guy who for technological reasons you know presses a button or says a magic word or whatever and becomes this better Mm -hmm. version of himself that can access technology and create vehicles out of light and whatever but instead it's an unreliable pal that he can summon sometimes depending on where the grid is at you know um and who even then he can't really control like auto man does what auto man does sometimes he's not even explaining what he's doing he's his own sentient creature like even now as wally's about to get his ass kicked by these bikers Auto Man's now looked at all the scraps of paper, has a decision, and he just, like, shows up at the diner at that point and introduces something that I am – was the most interested in this show because it's such an insane concept. But Auto Man walks in the diner, glowing blue. The bikers see him, and they are just, like – they look like they're just, like, I, I've just seen something from another world, something Lovecraftian appear here, and we have to flee. Like, they're so terrified. Yeah. And everyone who sees Auto Man – essentially loses their mind. They essentially go insane at the... Like, Auto Man doesn't actually have to fight people. He drives them insane at sight. Yeah, agreed. That scene was really strange. You expected the minute he showed up that it's going to be the big fight scene and these bikers are going to get their comeuppance now uh, for being so terrible. And But no, he shows up and just basically flexes and they all uh, run away. We, I assume this is because they don't want to have any stunt choreography and have actual fight scenes. But both of you are right. He just, every single time he shows up, everyone goes, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I'm either going to run away or faint or just mind my own business because did you see how glowing his suit was? And that's that's it. That's all. Because I kept thinking, I think we're almost an hour in and I still don't know what Auto Man's powers are because he just shows up and puts his hands on his hips. Yeah, that's it. agreed. His, yep. power is, his power is the power of madness, apparently, because that's what he does to everyone who sees him. <laughs> Although, Luke, we, we did mention a couple things real quick. When uh, they're on their not date at the diner and Auto Man shows up in the uh, in the basement, Cursor's with him and Cursor uh, is like the little light and it's zipping around the room and it goes right to a bikini poster on the wall and then just circles her breast with a heart. And I was like, <laughs> attaboy, Cursor. <laughs> and, listen, if Cursor appears on screen and there's anyone, uh, like any woman anywhere close to him, that's just like you're about to just get yeah. this joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and that I should also mention, and this, maybe both of you understand this better than I do. Wally has a computer at his home, and he also has a computer at the police department. And in both of those computers, he types in Auto Man Crime Time or whatever it is, and <laughs> Auto Man shows up if he feels like it, which is, by the way, a terrible program that he should have just put a zero instead of a one there and had him show up whenever you, you know, damn well please. But um, what I didn't understand is later on, Auto Man just shows up when he's not at a computer. So if he's able to do that, why is the computer even necessary? I totally agree. It's a good question. And they really le- – I'll give them this. They're really leaning in. Somebody did a bit of research on the technology because they're really talking about fo- – like there a lot of modem talk. Like you have to, he has to call his home modem and send messages to it in order to talk to Auto Man. So there's like a lot of conversation about network computers. Like there is a lot of conversation about – they're going to talk to the airline computer and see if there's any information. It Someone seemed to get the sense of how network computers were going to work and were trying to work within that. But it's just like, 
it's still a little bit magical. Like, why, why, why can Auto Man appear here and not there? Like, why does he need directions? I, I totally agree. I think exactly that. There was research done, and somebody actually put in the work. Like, they're kind of... It's almost like they're understanding what the internet's going to be, which is impressive because usually technology in these kind of shows, especially in shows that are clearly aimed at some level at kids, it's just magic. And But it, they do resort to magic for what you're talking about, Jordan, for when it's like, well, we need him now. So whoop, he appears like, well, there's no computer around and nobody summoned him. He's just suddenly here. But there's definitely an attempt to say, okay, there's a thing called a modem. And if I could get to a modem and call my home computer, then I could activate uh, Auto Man, blah, 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 which is impressive. But I think you're right. I think uh, it's similar to the point you're saying about, you know, will, will later episodes show Auto Man showing up in the day or will he be wearing an outfit so he doesn't have to be so sparkly or whatever it might be? I'm pretty sure that in later episodes, they're going to forget the whole thing about him needing a computer. I think he'll probably be at the beginning of an episode at the police department. But other than that, he'll probably just be able to show up wherever he needs because it's going to become a hindrance to the writing where they're going to like, Oh, God, he's got to find a computer. He's in the Sahara Desert. It's just, <laughs> forget it. He just shows up. Yeah, totally. Or the, there'll be computer stations everywhere he goes for some yeah. reason. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, in this particular case, when Auto Man does show up, he's figured out kind of some information about what happened to uh, Detective Curtis. And it, it relates back to Global Guard, a big uh, international private security firm. And he's just like, we better get over there and like do a little snooping around or as Auto Man calls it, breaking and entering, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> yeah. And and by the way, the policeman doesn't say, no, we shouldn't break and enter. He, he's, he's intrigued. Well, how are we going to do that when, when Auto Man suggests breaking and entering? It's because he's not a policeman. He's an IT guy. <laughs> oh, there you go. So yeah, he's not, he, he didn't swear to any code or anything. It's fine. What I did... What I do like is they're like, let's go over to this this like skyscraper, and uh, Auto Man gets a look at Wally's old beater of a car. And he's just like, screw that. Hey, cursor, draw me an auto car, please. <laughs> oh my god. I like the look of the car. It sort of looks like it's. I don't know what it actually is, but it's sort of maybe modeled on a Lamborghini of sorts. I think because um, it's a very flat sort of boxy car. But they have, you know, don't worry. This is not Tron. It's not a motorbike. But it looks very much like if Tron had a sports car in it, that's what it would look like. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very low polygon, like lots of like edges yes, and yes. like flat pieces. Yeah. Completely. Also glows blue. It looks like the tanks and missile command back in the day. You know, those video games where it was just straight green lines. <laughs> Absolutely. But it, also, cursor draws in everything you need, including the upholstery and all the details, <laughs> yeah. there, but not a seatbelt. He Ashtray. does not create a seatbelt because that would take away the comedy of seeing what happens when you turn those corners really fast. Cursor is basically yeah. a 3D printer, right? That's what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's just it. it. It's very much this. these cards live in a video game logic. So when they make a turn, it's like a perfect 90 degree turn, which is just like mind for not ending comedy for Wally. Like they just like have a camera pointed at the, the car set and the actor just has to throw himself against the windows every time that like they're pretending to do a turn. And I'm just like, how long does this actor have to like abuse his body this way? <laughs> Completely. As, as again, as, as you go forward into the series, it'll be interesting to see. Is that the go-to comedy gold every week? Every week, the the helicopter or whatever vehicle it is turns really hard. and They go into the turns at least three times in this show because it's the, apparently when they have a, the two car chases, they're on the exact same streets, I noticed, zipping around cars. But uh, they, they, that's, it's, they, think it, they think it's where the money is. Well, it's right. so funny, too, because on this drive over to the like global security or whatever... Auto Man gives us some exposition about how he works, but he's giving this exposition to his own creator, like as a own creator doesn't have any information. But he's just talking about how he's like he lives. Auto Man lives in a world of space and energy. Where here's here's the explanation for how he can become solid, Jordan. He can alter density to interact with his density to interact with the physical world, and for some reason he can also absorb Wally into his being, so that Wally can be within Auto Man. And they can do these insane mime sequences where Wally speaks through. So you hear Wally's voice, but the Auto Man actor is having to flap his lips as if he's saying these words. The scene yeah. of them merging for the first time it was so clearly shot as a romantic scene. It was very, very strange. It's funny. I My note was, and I'm not the expert on this, but you could very easily and have a lot of material of doing like a queer theory watch of this show because... It is possibly the most gay show we've ever seen, ever. It really is. And it's not just the notion of the two forms merging being necessarily queer or whatever. It's the way it's shot. Like, there's this, like, this push-in on, on Wally as he's pondering, like, 
really? When he says, move into my form. And then <laughs> he, it's like, enter my dimension. It's like, so anyway, it's like, well, good for them, I guess. I was trying to figure out from the point of view of the story why it's a good thing. I guess it means when that happens, then Wally is impervious to harm, right? Like he can't get shot or yeah. whatever. That appears to be the case. Is what the purpose of it is. If, if they combine, then you have a way of Wally getting out of a tough situation and Auto Man protecting because because Auto Man can change his density. Bolts go through him. He can walk through walls. It, all that stuff's there. Um, what I did like though is in this in this brief car explanation, uh, Auto Man also just drops. He's like, "Oh, uh, FYI, um, because I live in Computer Land, I'm friends with the LA traffic computer Pac Man, but not Donkey Kong. That guy's a jerk." <laughs> I'm like, you're like real, it was a real Pac-Man? joke for for video game fans in the 1984. He said Pac-Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a it is a strange concept that everything that lives inside of a computer also is basically like Ottoman. They're all sentient creatures just living in a digital world and you're just briefly interacting with them. And Auto, but Ottoman's pals with them all, don't worry about it. <laughs> um at any rate, they get to this uh Global Guard skyscraper. Uh, they merge together, as you said, I, as he says, come enter my dimension. And they, they merge together so that they can basically when he's inside Auto Man, Auto Man can like walk through a wall. Like he can lower his density and walk through a wall. Though I was just like, I think that I think Wally just dies if you do that. But yeah. that's fine. That's the magic of the show. Um, and I'll, I think right away, don't, doesn't Cursor come with them? Which, again, I don't know when Cursor is there and when he's not. Um, but as soon as they walk into the building, I think there's a woman walking down the hallway and Cursor chases her down the hallway they go around the corner you just hear her scream knowing that cursor you know he's all hands he's at it again <laughs> oh my so God. insane it's such an insane character like why 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 did you do this i don't understand <laughs> it adds nothing but it's just it's just a time stamp of like wouldn't it be funny if there was a a glowing bulb that you know picked up girls skirts and i think glenn larson has a history of putting funny sidekicky characters like in Battlestar Galactica there was the robot dog that the little kid had and then in, mm. in Buck Rogers there was the tweaky robot that went tweaky 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 and, and, and was sort of like but this isn't that though like first of all it's so heavily sexualized where yeah. it's like a, it's assaulting people and second like you said Luke it's a ball of light It's there's no character to it you can't say there's our merchandising there's our t-shirts it's like no not man it's it's a it's a dot you can't merchandise a dot it's yeah it's, it's truly bizarre um the when they're in this building too, it's kind of amazing. Like, Auto Man is like very overpowered. He's real OP because they get there and he's just and Auto Man's just like, I think the bad guys are in that boardroom having a conversation about the crime, and he just like X-ray visions the wall and hears everything there. So they never they never sneak in. They just have to stand outside the room and just stare through the wall. The bad guys are no clo- they have no idea he's there. It's just like I'm like this is crazy. Like he's just getting all the information by standing nearby. <laughs> <laughs> we do get a quick sense though where auto man where they start laying out the like rules of auto man because he's like oh i'm feeling a little low energy now uh let me stop by this electrical socket and just suck the electricity out of it yeah you're like okay so when you needed electricity previously you just got it but you didn't have to have an outlet okay stop asking questions right like move on by nothing to see here i did like as he sucks the electricity out of the uh, out of that socket i don't know if you noticed his uh, groaning reaction he's really into getting that electricity <laughs> <laughs> i was just like this is maybe not the best direction on how he should be reacting to this <laughs> at any rate they get the information they need global guards up to something they, of course, want to have a quick chase scene, so some goons, like, half-spot them as they're, like, walking out, and then it's just an excuse for Cursor to draw the auto car and them to have, like, a thing where they're, like, doing 90-degree turns everywhere, and the, the bad guys are like, if that car can do a turn that fast, so can I, and of course it just crashes into a building. I, I had a question about that, though. They're escaping the bad guys. They go into the parking lot where, again, there's no car there. They're creating the car. They create the car in the parking lot and then still have to go round around to get out of the parking lot. Why not just walk through the wall and make the car outside? Why save yourself the trouble? They, they, they just got, you're gone by the time these guys are getting their keys in the car. That just did. Oh, he's so OP. It's just like, why yep. don't you do a million other things? That's exactly it. I was going to say, it's the overpower problem again, where once you establish that he can walk through anything, then it's like, well, mm. there's no problem getting outside. Like, it's a whole, like, how do we get out of here? Well, you just walk in a straight line. Presumably, if you can alter your density, you could also drop through the floor, like, it's such a huge give as a power that everything after that seems like, well, you don't need to do any of these things. But it's a kid's What would show. be great is if um, 
Auto Man had a problem controlling his power and Wally is constantly horrified. Like, you know, the guys come chase him and he accidentally blows their heads up. And it's just <laughs> Wally, Wally having to deal with it. And Auto Man's like, I thought that's what you wanted. You know, that's a show. <laughs> that's, that's how you programmed me. Yeah. yeah. Well, all that. I mean, that's just it, right? Like, Auto Man can do anything. He can't be touched if he doesn't want to be. He's just Dr. Manhattan. Like, he should just have no mm. connection to humanity whatsoever. <laughs> Completely, completely. He should, and he should not care about our petty issues of who's kidnapping scientists. He should be like, whatevs. Like, he, also, I see no Burt Reynolds in his character at all. I'm just saying, <laughs> just, just for the record, no <laughs> Burt Reynolds. Oh my god, what a crazy collection! Like, Paul Newman, uh huh, Christopher Reeve, okay, Burt Reynolds, all right. <laughs> what does this Frankenstein of a, of a man look like, or sound like, or act like? At any rate, after the car chase, it's morning time, so Auto Man's got to go back into the computers. And Wally spends his day getting a hold of Tanya, the Interpol agent, so they can meet in Chinatown. And he can, like, tell, like, he shows up, he's just like, something about Global Guard, I guess. And she's just like, you've solved the whole case, Wally. <laughs> and she's European, so she gives him a kiss on the mouth, and Wally's just like, oh, a lady who likes me. <laughs> I don't know if it's here. It might be later in the show, but while this plot we're following with auto man and wally sort of investigating a crime there people keep getting abducted by this uh, uh what's the security company called luke Glo- uh, uh, global global guard Corp, global security something global whatever they are they're constantly abducting people and we kind of see them cut back and forth i think two or three times they abduct people and it's always the same they go to the airport they go hey you want a private plane and they get on the plane there's a couple things i liked about it one we get to see something that i love in tv which is the bad guy, you know, is very secretive that he has a gun and he pulls out the gun and then checks to make sure it's loaded, which I always love because why would you not do that at home before you left? But no, it's like, no, no, you get where you got to go. Then you check your bullets. But anyway, that's just for me. But they, they mention at this point that all these people are being abducted and then they go, oh, and everyone just assumes they died in a plane crash. And I thought, why would anyone assume that? There's been no indication there's any plane crashes. And these people have it like you've seen, like, as you mentioned, Luke, there's at one point a family watches the guy go with other people. It's like a plane crash isn't even uh, near the top of the list of things that could possibly happen. But everyone's just like, makes sense to me. 45 engineers all missing in the same way. Must have been a plane crash. (laughs) Must have been a plane crash. Totally. The Global Guard's just that good. I mean, Wally meets Tanya, tells her all this. She gives him a kiss. She walks away immediately kidnapped by Global Guard. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Those guys are good. Well, you know why? Because they made sure to check the bullets just before they left. They checked the bullets. The gun is loaded. And it's it's great because she gets abducted. Wally just goes back to the police station because it's his day job. Puts out he, he can put out an APB. He puts out an APB on the limo. And uh, his captain, Captain Boyd, comes in. And she, he's just like, what are you doing? Put out APBs. You're the IT guy. You can't do that. And then the captain turns around and com- just complains to some random detective who turns out to be working for a global guard as well. Like, it's the the tendrils of the conspiracy are so deep. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And that guy, that's another guest star where you're like, oh, Doug McClure is in this. Like, Doug mm-hmm. McClure was like a big 70s actor. It's like, oh, Doug. So I thought Doug McClure was going to be like an ongoing character in the too. show. And I did wonder at a moment, like, what's his purpose in this? Like, I understand what the angry cop boss does. I understand what Roxanne does. But I don't know what Doug. And so as soon as you saw this scene, you realize, oh, he's the bad guy. Yeah, because up to this point, guy. his role was just to be the guy that the angry cop complains to. Yes, exactly. Explains and complains. Yeah, totally. Well, that's just it. So this this dirty cop grabs Wally. He's like, well, I guess I'm taking you on the plane, too. You're getting kidnapped. And as they're going down the elevator, of course, it's it, I guess night has fallen. So <laughs> Auto Man appears in the elevator. And this cop doesn't faint or pass out. He seems to just go into a, like, a coma. Like, his eyes are wide awake. And he just, like, slouches down and sits on the floor. And he just won't move. He's just got, he's so traumatized by the appearance of Auto Man. He, he just becomes non-functional. It's incredible. I think he might be dead. I think he yeah. might have just killed him. <laughs> well, and then Auto Man talks to the computer, which we come to find out everything in this world, like the the elevators are run by computer and they're also talking elevators. So he asks mm. the elevator to, I guess, go into service mode and just hold the cop in a comatose state in that elevator until they, for a period of time. Do you think there's going to be some nuanced conversations about sentience and about what Wally has done by creating Auto Man <laughs> through this series? Oh, for sure. I, for sure. The implications of AI, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
they, at any rate, they, they race themselves to the airport in the auto car to try to, I guess, stop the plane that Roxanne's being kidnapped on. They get there too late, but not to worry. Cursor, draw me an auto plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just that simple. I love how simple it is to just make a new plane. And then they, they do the same blue lights on it, so it all sort of fits the look of it. But what I really liked is, because when they get to the airport, the plane's gone, but one of the goons is still waiting there. And, like, the goon tries to shoot them, but the bullets go through Auto Man. And, again, because Auto Man never has to fight anybody, basically the goon sees Auto Man, tries to shoot him, doesn't work, and the goon's just like, well, you're clearly God on Earth. I don't know how to explain you, so I'm going to commit myself to your cause. Like, he, the, the goon just says, bring me with you on your trip on this plane. I, I'm now a tool of Auto Man. Yeah, exactly. Just, like, surrenders immediately. And the thing I thought was funny about the plane, too, was that clearly the car is a car. You know, like, they, it's a car that they've tricked out, mm-hmm. that they've put these things, they've changed in some way. But the plane is not a plane. And when you see it later flying, <laughs> that's, like, the single worst effects of the show. That, <laughs> that plane, like, whoa, that is a real, like, model. And also, you notice they didn't show it taking off. It all happens inside the plane when they take off because they had nothing to show other than a, probably a terrible model shot of a... <laughs> of a plane getting air. And I don't know if it's at this point or if we saw it earlier, but the first time we find out that the bad guys are in Switzerland, there's a very long sequence, maybe it's this sequence, of the a plane landing and cars driving up and people getting out yeah. of cars. And one of those like TV things where you go, you know, these shows aren't easy to drag out to 42 minutes. You know, we got <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, people gonna... are getting their luggage, they're having their passports <laughs> yeah, exactly. checked. You're like, oh, yeah, okay, oh, I get it. We're in Switzerland. We get it, guys. Yeah. But I love also that they're landing at what is obviously a real airport, at, but the, the Chiron or whatever that comes up on the screen says somewhere in Switzerland. Yes. And I was like, why so coy, Glenn Larson? Like, you, you can tell us where they are. Like, okay, they don't know where they are, but you can tell us it's Geneva or whatever. It just seems so ridiculous. Like, why tell us it's Switzerland at all if you're going to be so vague about it? Well, it's exactly funny, too, because the I think the I think some of the characters are saying, we're in the Alps. So I'm like, well, you could have just said the Alps. Then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so apparently what's been happening, and we'll get into this now, because we've seen clips of it over the course of the episode, but they haven't meshed with the plot yet. But what's been happening is... All these indispensable scientists, if they get to the point in their company where they're so useful, they can't like the company can't live without them. But they say like they mentioned to somebody who's like, I'm thinking about looking for a new job. So what the company does is they hire Global Corp to kidnap their own scientist to make it look like they've like just disappeared off the face of the earth. They fly them to Switzerland to this like snow covered resort where they're basically now forced to continue to work at their job for the company. They can't leave. But they're making up to the scientists because the resort is, like, full of anything they could want. Any food, anything they want, and just bikini babes everywhere. Yeah, it is funny. It's it's this idea that there's an understanding that you as a viewer get. That if you were a scientist and you had your normal life and you had your job, would you not want to trade that to work at... Uh, this all all inclusive resort with bikini babes at all times. Yes, you would give up your life. A hundred percent. That's the, it, it's a wish fulfillment thing. Yeah. Even though it's being presented as a as a punishment for these people, and and Curtis is going, you know, oh, we got to get out of here. There's he's there's no way to ski out of here or whatever. But, <laughs> yeah. but meanwhile, he's walking around and people are like, you know, it's like it's like ugly fat dudes are cavorting with bikini yeah. babes. And and I wrote that one line. He said when he's explaining to uh, uh, to Tanya what, what's happening here. And by the way, there is a sign at one point. There's one point you see a sign that says the Alpine Institute of Technology. Oh. Whatever. Um, but he says, uh, uh, we're prisoners in a winter wonderland. The finest luxuries that life can afford. Swimming, skiing, all the pretty ladies. He's saying this <laughs> to Tanya, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, all the pretty ladies. That sounds like lyrics to a Neil Diamond song, by the way. <laughs> What I noticed, too, is as I was watching these sequences, because, you know, it's obviously this very dumb concept and like, oh, there's only bikini babes in this. Also, Winter Wonderland. Why are you swimming in bikinis? I don't know. Yeah. But if yeah. you watch the scenes, there are no scenes where the actual scientists are interacting. The The women are only talking to themselves and yes. the men never <laughs> interact with them. And I'm just like, so this is accurate. like this is that they're just like, we're not talking to you. We don't like you. And I, and I wonder whether it's a uh, sort of. I wonder if he was inspired by the prisoner because it's basically the prisoner setup, right? That you're you're unhappy at your job, you want to quit. Your uh, your bosses in, instead take you off to a village somewhere where you're sequestered and they're trying to get information out of you. But it's just so just done so poorly because again, I kept thinking 
So these scientists are still doing their, they all work for different companies, but now yeah. they're still somehow doing the job they were doing back home, but now but they're doing resort. it at the Alpine Institute, which looks like a holiday in, and it, it just, nothing really tracked. And then I'm, you'll get there, Luke, but when you see what the guys who won't conform to the new plan, when, when they're put in that pr- basement prison where you only see their arms coming out of the jail cells and they're like, no, let me free. You're like, I don't, this isn't tracking for me at all. So the other scientists are like, Okay, I'll ski and the bikini babes, and I'll continue I'll work to work eight do... hours a day, and then yeah, continue doing exactly. My job. Can't really track any of this in, in a sensible way. Yeah, and at any rate, the auto plane arrives in Switzerland, and like it's it's that thing, like you said, it's like as it's as it's flying over the tarmac about to land, Auto Man's like, oh, up oh, out of power. Um, so you can do a scene where like Wally and this this goon who's now working for them like drops like two feet to the ground onto their butts. Yeah, real comedy moment sitting on It'd the tarmac. It'd be funnier like... if they were actually going at the speed a plane would go you know whatever <laughs> 500 miles an hour and it just they just hit the ground it just all the skin comes off their butts yeah totally. that's what i wanted to see like, you mean if, if in any way this behaved according to the principles of physics and momentum and whatever which none it never does i keep thinking the same thing about turning the corners in that car it's like he would just be jelly inside the car it's going 500 miles an hour and turning 90 degree corners but instead it's just like wacky like my face is flat against the window you know kevin i think they explained he's a hologram with density so i think that answers all the questions you have <laughs> <laughs> Science addressed. Yeah. <laughs> so it's up to Wally and the goon now to get into this resort, and they they come up with a very classic gambit of how you get like when you when you're working with the bad guy, how do you get into the bad guy's headquarters? Uh, you pretend to be his prisoner. Classic move. Yeah. And you take your finger for anyone at yeah. home. Take your finger. You put it in your pocket. You point it forward, and everyone knows that's a universal sign for I have a gun in my pocket. Yeah. Even though you're in a place where you, all the bad guys are supposedly your colleagues, so there's no reason to hide a gun. There, the, the, no one thinks of saying, why are you holding your gun in your suit pocket? And why is your gun so small? And why are you marching behind this man? Yeah. With, like Everyone else is carrying submachine guns. Yeah, if I was a bank teller and, and, a, and someone came in to rob the bank and had their finger in their jacket, I'd be like, let me see that gun. I'll get the money <laughs> when I see the gun. But it's like, because everyone who has a gun is quite happy to show you a gun. If they're putting it in a pocket, <laughs> it's a finger. <laughs> yes. Um, they try this prisoner gambit. It actually doesn't work at all. They're immediately like caught. The bad guys are immediately on the fact that this isn't like really what's happening. They like drag Wally down to like the, the resort prison they built and give him truth drugs, I guess. So they can get the real, like, how did you get here? <laughs> Wally- but we don't see that at all. No, no. Well, we, well, it all happens off screen, and they're like, well, he just keeps telling this story, but Auto Man, the truth drugs aren't working. Well, let's just let him go live in the resort and go hang out with his friend, Detective Curtis, and Tanya, the Interpol agent. Like, they just let Wally go. They're just like, go hang out at the resort with your pals. We don't care. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of bad guy logic in this last half of the show, which is completely untrackable. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Like, why they just don't kill him or whatever. Like, they're, they're, they're these... I mean, they're kidnapping... I mean, again, I know I'm trying to apply some sort of police logic to it, but these guys are, if they were found to be doing what they're doing, they would go to jail forever. Like, it's massive international crimes, what they're doing. But then they're really like, well, I guess we'll just let him go and follow him around and see if he leads us to any clues. It's like, no, put him in one of those jail cells in the basement where you've got those other guys. Like, why are you being so nice to Wally? It, it is very weird, because, like, that's what happens. They He meets his pals, and then the goon takes them. He's like, hey, come to this computer room. I think he didn't get put in prison because of nepotism, because of who his mother is. <laughs> there you Who's go. his mother? Hmm? Who's his mother? Lucille Ball. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he's Desi Ernest oh. Jr. Yeah, totally. <laughs> they just wanted to, they wanted to be on his good side, because maybe they get to meet Lucy? Yeah. <laughs> totally. She was a, very, a, a powerful force in Hollywood at the time, you know? Mm-hmm. But, yes, at any rate, the plan is to just see what he does if they let him loose and, like, the goon who's on his side takes him to the like they have their own computer room just a big room full of computers just like at the police station <laughs> while he calls up his home modem i think he pushes the button on the wall that says phone modem i think yeah yeah if there's like two labeled buttons and one of them is phone modem yeah <laughs> so he's able to i guess I just, this is what i didn't fully understand he's able to call up auto man and tell him where he is but Auto Man dropped him off there. Auto Man knows where he is. Yeah, there's no mystery whatsoever in Auto Man's mind. It's just whether it's just whether it's the right time of day on the electricity grid. That should be the or, only or thing. Or if Auto Man feels like it. He might be busy. He <laughs> might be busy that. with Pac-Man. He doesn't have time. <laughs> but 
the bad guys catch them doing this and they're like all right well now that we know you wanted to use your computer we're just gonna execute you now so i don't know what they discovered that was useful but they're like all right now we're finally gonna get around to murdering you all uh, can i just point out patrick mcnee who plays the head of this this you know evil institute um i think his character's name is hamilton um First of all, I, I have no great affection. For, I love the Avengers, the old 60s Avengers, but, you know, he's really not a great actor, and he's really just doing the thing he does when he shows up. W- one thing I think uh, I noticed, because this is what, this is about 1983 they're filming this, and the yep. Avengers was, what, late 1960s, right? Yep, yep. His head got tremendously bigger, right? I agree. He, he I thought, how did he get so old? This is only, yeah. a, like, I think the Avengers went into the early 70s. This is maybe 10 years after that. He is a much bigger man. He's mm-hmm. wearing the ascot to hide his neck flab. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's not thought. looking, and he speaks in this very kind of strangled high-pitched kind of he sounds like one of the lollipop guild from the wizard of oz <laughs> like he has this very strange and his i think he ad-libbed a lot of his dialogue or at least changed it or maybe i'm giving too much credit to uh to glenn larson by thinking he didn't write this but his i, I wrote down a few of his lines because they really don't scan as dialogue so like when they come into that computer room um and find them and again we don't know why they've been so kind to him and let him wander around and do whatever but his excuse when he comes in to find them is he says i needed to know your most immediate source of rescue (laughs) what like i I don't know how that helps you at all to know that what he was going to do was go to the computer room now that i know that i will kill you instead of killing you two hours ago like completely bananas and he has another line when when they're escaping later that i'll i'll do my patrick mcnee impression i love it i want to for the rest of this podcast keep doing that voice (laughs) It's just, I didn't, again, I, just, I think the problem is you can't parse what the bad guys are doing at all. They're just bad guys in a kid's show doing bad things. Yeah, and they and, come up so late and the, there's no time for them to have new, because they only have like 10 minutes left of the show. So it's just like beat, beat, beat. Well, yeah, it we, is. We got to get to a chase. Thing where if you stop and go, what is Hamilton, right? What is his yeah. goal? He's just running a security company that is helping other companies dispose of in a very positive way their trouble employees so is he just taking a big like he's just taking a, a paycheck for that like i don't know what his goal is yeah no yeah. He, he just runs he, the he facility has, he, he bought this resort and he's like oh, i gotta get people here yeah he's not blowfeld or so he's not trying to take over the world or get no. power for himself he's just he's running a company and the, his, the service he provides is we take your the, the scientists who want to leave your company and we force them to still work for you but in, in, in exchange they can ski and hang around the pool with pretty ladies that's the business model of what he does it's yeah, not really he's a resort owner. on its face. It's just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's a resort owner, exactly. Yeah, they, they march, of course, when they march them out to execute them, night has fallen, thank God, so which means Ottoman can <laughs> arrive. He does, he he has he has cursor print him a 3D tank, which scares away all the, like, all the heavily armed goons see this, like, tank appear, and they're like, well, we gotta go. Uh, just constantly, Auto Man never actually fights anyone. It's always about like some sort of terrifying vision he gives them. Do we think that tank could have fired? Because everything else that Auto Man uh, makes, as you mentioned, Kevin, is completely operational. The plane flies, the car flies. I think it could no have seat fired. Belts, but I'm assuming <laughs> that the tank could also fire. I yeah. believe so. I had the same reaction. I thought, okay, he's going to kick some ass with this tank, which actually <laughs> kind of makes sense if he can do, if he can create anything, then create a really aggressive thing. But he just creates it as like a feint, like as a thing to get them to go, oh no, a tank, and then it goes away. It does have that funny thing that reminded me of like, um, sort of like Golden Age uh, Green Lantern comics, where it's like, Hal Jordan can create anything with his mind, and what he creates is a big fist. And I'm like, <laughs> Hal, you you could do anything. You, why just make a big fist to punch the guy? And that's what this kind of reminded me of. You make a tank, it's like, great, he's going to shoot it. It's like, nah, it's just a tank. It just sits there. It's like, well, it could have been anything then. Like, yeah, I don't know. You could have created an explosive device. You could have exactly. created something to, to contain those guys. You could have created a wall to separate you from those guys. Mm-hmm. No, I created a tank to scare them for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it gets weirder from there because this tank scares off all the heavily armed goons. So now you've just got the bad guy with a gun. And the bad guy's just like, well, screw this, I guess. I'm going to take Kanye, Tanya by gunpoint to the airport and get out of here. And Auto Man's solution is just like, well, you know that Jeep that's in the parking lot that you drive? I've made two more. Which one's your real Jeep? And then the bad guy gets in the right Jeep and drives away. He's playing like the shell game. Like, yeah, that you yeah, see on the street. Monty. That's what he's playing. He's like, which car is yours? You're like, what? That's what, that, that's what he's using his power for? Well, it doesn't even do anything because the guy just gets in the right Jeep and drives away. <laughs> and, and then Automan is deducing now that the, or was is it Wally that says this? They, they understand that 
the bad guy's plan, that Hamilton's plan is to get to the airport. But if he gets there ahead of them, he will leave Tanya behind um, and take off and then they'll never be able to find him. And I'm thinking, I have no idea how he's connecting any of these dots. <laughs> Why you think the evil guy who's been kidnapping people would, when he gets there, go, okay, Tanya, you can go now. I, I have no idea. Anyway, it just makes no sense. Like the the notion of them imagining what this guy's plan is doesn't track well, at all. That's just it. So they like they get their own auto plane so they can fly back to the airport faster to them. So they can like they're like, what we'll do is we'll make a fake jet and that'll really throw them off. But the thing is, the deduction they've done is correct because when the bad guy gets there, he doesn't know it's a fake plane. But he gets there and he's just like, all right, well, see you later, Tanya. I'm gonna leave you here. And it's not like I'll I'll get you later, Auto Man, or I'm gonna come back. The bad guy announces, he's like, well, I'm retiring. I have all this money. I'm going to yeah. get some plastic surgery. And, like, this is the last you'll see of me. Like, I'm done being evil. So I'll see you guys later. And it's just totally. like, oh, so this guy, like, th- he's fine. Like, he's like, it's over for me. I'm just going to go hang out at su- in the on a beach somewhere with some minor plastic surgery. Yeah. And this is the line I was talking about, where it, which just was like, what? Patrick, did you rewrite this line? Because <laughs> the, the line actually is, a little plastic surgery, some bribes in the right places, and life will be splendid for the rest of my life. (laughs) No writer typed that, surely. Life will be splendid for the rest of my life. But I was the exact same as you, Luke. I'm thinking, this is your evil mastermind that Autumn... He's just like, I got the money, smell you later. Like, uh, that's the end of his evilness, is like, I I hereby give up being a bad guy, I just want to go live on a beach. Yeah, he's just like, well, this is over. Like, I, I clearly can't work again. So I guess I'm retired. I'm, I'm old enough. I've got the money. I like it. He's not going to be the recurring bad guy. It's not like, I'll get you next time, Auto Man. It's like, you know what? You win, Auto Man. Smell you later. <laughs> but what's great is we know the plan that Auto Man has before they get there is that he's basically made a, a, a perfect Auto Man recreation. Cursor has 3D printed a new jet for him to get on. So we know he's go- that's how they're going to get him. It's like, he's going to get on this jet, but it's Auto Man's jet. That's the scam. And what we see is the bad guy leaves Tanya behind, the jet takes off and starts flying, and they're like, well, we did it, we, we caught him. And then they cut up to the plane, and the, the bad guy's just like, oh, that's weird, the pilots aren't responding to me, let's go no, look no, at Luke, the No, no, Luke, it's better than that. The first thing he notices, which is one thing that Auto Man forgot to do, which was heating, because right, he, right. He, he says, I wrote it down, they're sitting in the plane, they're just, you know, it's a private plane, they're enjoying themselves, and he goes it's strangely cold in here for some reason. That's the line. And I was like, <laughs> that is a sign that this is now an auto man plane. You should know better. Well, that's it. They go into the, pi- the the cockpit. They see there's no pilots there. And then auto man appears to dissolve the plane at like 90,000 feet and drop them to their deaths. <laughs> yeah. Like that, it, ends, it just ends with the plane dissolving as they're standing in the cockpit. I'm just like, oh, so you guys aren't catching them and bringing them back. Auto man just executed these two men. Well, it's actually a, a kind of neat idea that Auto Man's powers only extend so far. So the hologram only, you know, they certain got to a certain distance mm. and it starts uh, breaking down. But you're right. It's such a ruthless thing for Auto Man to do for someone who had already given up. And I'm sure they could just find him or you can control that plane. Just make the plane. Make the plane fly wherever you want it to yeah. fly. That's what I thought. Just make the plane turn around and land. No, you got to kill him. And the real <laughs> crime here is that these Major corporations have hired a kidnapping company, but you just killed the man who knows everything, so no one's going to go to jail now. I hadn't even thought of that. That's so true. The actual the actual conspiracy of the crime mm-hmm. involves all those people who hired this guy, but they're not being called on for anything. It's just He's just a like, facilitator. I don't blame him at all. No, no. He was only following orders. He's just a guy trying to make a buck. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's so many questions about the duplicating plane gag. Like, where... So, presumably, there was a real plane there. That we didn't see. Like, they put, uh, somehow did Auto Man hide that plane around the corner? Did he just. He made an Auto Man sheet that covered the plane. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and as, as that's it. All, Auto Man and Wally now saved the day. All the scientists have been saved. Lieutenant, or Detective Curtis has been saved. Tanya has been saved. We cut back to LA. They're back at the police station. And for whatever reason, Wally. T- Give me like Wally tells Detective Curtis, he's like, we're going to keep Auto Man a secret. We're not going to talk about this. Like for no apparent reason. It's just like Auto Man needs to be a secret. Like mm-hmm. they don't want to announce it. So they all apparently agree it. And there's just ends on this comedy scene where where Detective Curtis is like, well, if I can't mention Auto Man, how am I going to write my reports? Dun, 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 dun. I know yeah. this, this this desperate need to maintain the status quo at the end where it's like, even though 
Uh, Ottoman saved the day, and therefore Wally is kind of a hero in a, within some logic of the show. Like, no, they have to deny all that so that the police chief can be angry at him every week going forward. That's got to be the beat they play every week, so you can't have him be a winner in any way. And the, the whole notion of hiding Ottoman, it's kind of what you went back to before, Jordan, where you go, it's kind of built like it should be his secret identity, or it should be a mm-hmm. thing he becomes, because then you know why he wants to hide it. But in this version, why would he... He's done an amazing technological yeah, thing. Yeah, Wally clearly wants recognition. Like, I don't understand why he would hide it. Yeah, it makes no, no he sense. No, he should now sell the Automan program to all the different police departments in the world and make a fortune, because it works. Like, he's yeah. not Automan, you know? Yeah. It murders the criminals sometimes, true, but yeah. whatever. Occasionally, you know what? There's a little bug in everything, you know? Yeah, totally. Listen, a, a, a giant worldwide police state of auto men, it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Un- until people start using their uh, coffee makers and yeah, uh, toaster that's ovens. That's true. Then... That's when crime really <laughs> picks up. The cr- yeah. crime rates at night are 0%, but it's 600% <laughs> at 8 in the morning. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's like the pilot, the the, the two hour long movie version of uh, Auto Man to really get you into what this show is going to be. Um, I don't know. You guys want to get? You want to have any last notes, or do you want to get into ratings? I just want to say one thing, which is that I, when I looked it up online again, I didn't read very much about it because I wanted to see it kind of fresh. But I, I, I and who knows? Maybe this is just maybe this isn't true, and it just got repeated as truth on the net. But they claim this was the most expensive show on TV when it was made. Oh, I don't know. And that, that that's why it only lasted one season because although the numbers were okay, the um, but that sounds to be like something Glenn Larson would have said in interviews. Like, oh, we were ahead. It was just so expensive. I have to say, I looked up where it was in the ratings. It wasn't that high. I think it was in the 60s, like oh, in the, man, of yeah. the top 100 shows. So it wasn't high. And I, I do know who the top, if anyone's ever interested, I do know what the top 10 shows are that season. Uh, number one show, ready? Dallas. Mm. And Knott's Landing was number 11. Who watched Knott's Landing? But anyways, wow. I think he's uh, spinning a bit of a narrative that's made, maybe not true. Because I'm sure that these effects were expensive for their time, but there's nothing else about the show that's, ex- that's expensive. No. Like all yeah, of it the, doesn't strike you as that expensive. I mean, all the sets, like the police set, and that again, the weird basement that he lives in. And, like, and you know, yes, they went to Switzerland, which was clearly, you know, the mountains of California. I'm sure it's like within a two-hour drive of L.A., wherever that resort was, mm-hmm. right? Like it wasn't, it did, nothing about it spoke as expensive to me, especially when you get into, like you guys were saying, it's not like there's action. It's not like you have to have, you know, stunts and, and like, no, the whole a thing A surprising is, lack of action. Yeah, a surprising lack, you, totally. You only had to rent a tank that had to sit still and not do anything and then go away. <laughs> like that tank didn't even have to move. You didn't have to pay for the gas of that tank. Yeah, totally. It is funny because in a lot of these shows, we we made fun of them, you know, uh, Galactica 1980 or Planet of the Apes and things of, you know, generally this time period. The stunt choreography and the fighting is never that great, but it's kind of fun. And I remember in Planet of the Apes, we always laugh because the one guy, every single fight, his opening move was a drop kick. That's how he started. But this show doesn't have any of that. And it's kind of remarkable to know and to see if that's what it's going to be going forward. Because maybe it really is just that this costume, they're like, guy, we got one of this costume. We cannot damage this thing. He's not doing any physical movement in this green screen outfit. But it is weird because how many more episodes can we just have him showing up and put his hands on his hips and then people faint? Totally. And on the, and I know this is from the same era as the A-Team and they always got in arguments with um, parental groups and whatever about, you know, gunplay and whatever on a show that was made for kids. So I get that there might have been some move against violence in what's clearly a kid's show, but there's violence and there's violence. Like he still could have thrown a punch. There still could have been some interaction. Like there's no physical interaction at all. It's just shock and awe. That's his weapon. And I'm also yeah, surprised that for a Glenn Larson show, how few sort of fish out of water jokes there were for um, Auto Man. I was sure that's what it was going to be like this sort of buddy cop kind of thing. And like Auto Man's constantly, he's very intelligent, but he's still a computer. So he doesn't understand um, right. the nuance of conversations or colloquialisms or whatever it might be. But there's, I, I'm trying to think, I don't think there's any of that in, except for him pretending to be James Bond. Yep, you're totally right. You think you'd have him saying, "Explain emotions to me, Wally." Yeah, exactly. But nothing, nothing like that ever happens. It's totally like he's the master of it all. Like he understands everything. And and been... as a result of that, he's kind of one note. Like I actually don't think the guy was that bad. This uh, uh, Chuck yeah, I think Wagner he did a good job as Auto Man. Yeah, I think he's fine. But it's just like, is he a character that you, if let's say you're a kid, you're an 11 year old kid, are you going to grasp onto this? I don't know. Is there's not much personality there? At least Hulk like smash things. Yeah. Totally, right? It, like, expressed rage and frustration yeah. or whatever. He, Automan's just smarter than everybody else. 
you know, and can create anything, can walk through anything. He's not very interesting as a result. Like you say, he's got no growth. And I'll be interested to see if that continues throughout the show, too, because mm-hmm. I bet that's a writing problem that they're going to have to address as they get into episodes. He's less of that rough and tumble hero. He's he's almost more of a magician, right? Like everything he does is like, look over there. Like I don't actually interact. I, I look over there. Check this out. It, it it's it's a weird for stuff we've seen in this area, right, Jordan? It's there. You know, you can expect some. There's gonna be a car chase. There's gonna be a fight sequence. This has the car chases, but it has no fight sequences, which mm-hmm. is weird because it's an action show. I'm amazed mm-hmm. though that they didn't have like the local uh, sheriff uh, get confused and try chasing him down the road, and then them zip down a road and hide behind something. That seemed like it was designed for that, but maybe in a later episode we'll get the old uh, still time f- flummoxed sheriff. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's let's rate these, uh, Kevin. Why don't you kick us off? What do you think? Out of out of ten. You know, you know how this works. Well, how, I, how do you feel about this? As, as a thing to watch and enjoy, I'd probably give it higher than its quality level because it's clearly not a well-written, well-made show. But I certainly enjoyed watching it. I'd say six. I don't want to give it too high. I don't want to. I don't want to praise it because. But I do. I. I was never bored watching it, and I laughed a lot. I made a lot of notes. There was there was a lot of moments I rewound and called my wife into the room to check this out. <laughs> Particularly looking at the the pictures. She of, loves when you do that, right? Oh yeah, oh hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel the same way. Like, I didn't, like, it wasn't, like, bad to watch, and it was just, like, it was pretty speedy, considering it was a two-hour, like, movie pilot, but it was also, like, I'm just, like, it was also just, like, I'm, like, this is also kind of empty. Like, it's yeah. weird. It's enjoyable, but, like, too empty to be, like, overly enjoyable, yeah. so I'm also going to give it a six. We're going to go with the most evil number ever, and I'm also <laughs> going to give it a six. Um, so we've got a 666 on this, uh, this pilot, and I think for the same reasons you guys have. It was... It was a kind of fun, enjoyable thing to watch for a podcast like this. You know, if it was 1983 or 84, would I have been waiting for next week's episode? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. If I was, you know, if I was really young, like I remember when I was, I've mentioned the show to you before, Jordan, I watched Holmes and Yo-Yo, which is a show Mm -hmm. you guys should consider doing sometime. It's about a a cop and his robot cop partner. And it's a total kids show. Like it's wacky that, you know, John Shuck plays the robot and he's like, you know, He's he drinks water and it short circuits him. Wah, 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 that kind of thing. <laughs> but but I I was probably ten when that show came on and I thought it was genuinely funny. But I bet by the time I was twelve, I would have said, well, that's just stupid, I, you know, whatever. And this show kind of falls into that. I think I think to really enjoy it, you have to have a certain kind of innocence uh, to mm-hmm. you uh, with your expectations of what a story is because it's just not trying hard enough to make any of the dots connect. Yeah, I think you're right. I think when you said this is a kid show, I'm realizing like, you're right. Like you kind of, it's most enjoyable when you just like view it through that lens. Once you kind of get in that mode, it's just weird because it, it is a kid show, but it's so heavily tech driven. Mm-hmm. And then like the wacky sidekick is so clearly too adult for a kid yes. show. Like, like why have a kid's show where there's like a, 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 a cursor that's going up ladies' skirts and down their blouses? Like it's like, that's insane. I really am hoping though that there's more scenes of Auto Man uh, sucking electricity in and clearly getting off on it. <laughs> oh, off. electricity. <laughs> like, oh, geez, Auto Man. <laughs> Long you're extended sequences. You're in the computer with Pac-Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, an interesting start to Auto Man. Uh... I, I'll be very curious. I don't. I still don't quite have a sense of like what the average episode of this is quite going to be. So we'll definitely have to see kind of what the first two episodes look yeah. like to see what the engine of the show really is. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm genuinely intrigued. I think more so than any other show you guys have done to see how this plays out as a show. And I must admit, I, I did. I spoilered myself a little bit, and I took a look at the descriptions of a couple of random episodes from down the road on IMDb, and I was very impressed. Like I think, like in terms of their bananas. Like, and and it's also that thing of. You know, there's certain 70s or 80s tropes of like if you're doing a series, you're gonna have one where this happens, or you're gonna have one, you're gonna have the evil twin episode, you're gonna have yeah. whatever. And this, there's a lot of those. Well, I didn't look at all of them. I think I looked at three, but I, already I saw two of those were like, oh, it's the episode where they do that. So right. I'm quite right, excited right, right. to see how it works. You hit, you're gonna hit all the beats, all the classics. Yeah, all the classics exactly. I don't, I think Glenn didn't reach very far when he was, you know, setting up a show. He's like. I'm sure he had cards on his wall where he's like, we're going to do the this episode, the that episode, the that episode, you know. Um, it's probably harder for Glenn once he go- if he gets a second season because he's like, oh, we did all the episodes. Yeah, totally, totally. They right? already wore the fake mustache. What do we do? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us for this first episode of Auto Man. We appreciate having you back. Oh, it's a total pleasure, guys. Anytime. And uh, listener... If uh, you want to see some clips of Auto Man, we're going to... I mean, there's some fun stuff mm-hmm. here. Uh, we're going to have them on Instagram and Twitter. The handle there is at Continuum Drag.
And of course, if you have anything you want to tell us about Auto Man, you can always email us at the Continued Drag email. That's continuedrag at gmail.com. But I think that about wraps it up for this episode. Thank you for joining us, listener. Jordan, I will see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rex Seedler. Produced by Jordan Dulloch and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Hughes.